Aloha! Welcome to tonight's Friday night uh, special presentation of uh, Did Moses Have Horns? Tonight we're doing uh, Ancient Oblivion. Uh, that's those things that we've forgotten about collectively or the things that uh, that have been kept from us, like hidden history and things like that. So welcome. If you're joining us in the live stream, welcome to all the future people. Today's topic is Did Moses Have Horns? I don't know how many people have heard about this, like the concept that Moses may or may not have had horns. This harkens back to an ancient Jewish legend uh, about Moses and who Moses was and what he actually looked like. Ancient Jewish scholars would debate over the specifics of the Talmud or the uh, the Old Testament, parts of the Old Testament as we would call it. And one of the one of the things that they would debate about was the meanings of the words, because some ancient Hebrew words or Paleo Hebrew or Phoenician words, um, they would have different meanings and uh, you really had to dive into it in order to get the context for what it was trying to say. Did it mean this word, which has the same exact letters, or did it mean this word, which has the same letters as that one, right? So today we're going to we're gonna dive into this. As you can see, I put up a couple of pictures up here. What's up, everyone in the chat? Hey, good to see all you. I like the Felix the Cat. Michael Takar is a little Felix the Cat. That's awesome. So I put some pictures up here and I'm going to put some more pictures, it's just some examples of people that have depicted Moses from the Bible. And, and that's the, that's the Moses we're talking about. The Moses, the story where Moses of the, uh, the Israelites, uh, went up onto Mount Sinai and God wrote out the 10 commandments and he had the tablets, you know, the, the whole story of Moses. Moses was the leader of the, uh, ancient Israelites. He's, he's the one that led them out of, uh, of Egypt. He's the one that went before the Pharaoh and said, let my people go time and time again. And he was rejected time and time again until finally, uh, you know, uh, God, the God of the Israelites started to bring about these plagues upon the ancient Egyptians. Every time that the, uh, that the Pharaoh, the Egyptian Pharaoh said, no, I will not release my, my slaves. Basically that's what they were depicted as. Uh, every time he said, no, there was a plague that was unleashed, right? So this is the same exact Moses that we're talking about. Now, Moses, we could, we'll probably do a lot more about this particular biblical character. I've, there's, there's so many interesting characters that show up, especially in the Old Testament. And so much is just unknown about them, you know, as they themselves have become cartoonified over time. And, uh, people don't know much about their backstory, their history or anything. As a matter of fact, the Bible itself only really picks up uh, with Moses' story when he's about 80 years old. This happens when Moses is about 80 which is really interesting, right? Because that means there's a whole 80 year period that's not discussed most of his life. If he, you know, if he lived to, uh, to be like an old man, how, how, how long we live for, right? Uh, so remind me about that in the future and I'll definitely chime in and I'll fill in some of the blanks about his, uh, his life growing up and what that was like. It's really interesting. So let's get back to this. Moses was depicted as having horns across time in many different mosaics, in different statues and carvings and paintings and drawings, right? Oh, I just got a donation from Anthony on TV. It says, I really appreciate everything you do. I can't wait for this presentation. Thank you for researching the truth. You're super welcome, Anthony. And thank you too. So let's check this out. I'm going to, I'm going to jump right into some stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to show you in the Bible, the biblical verse. Remember, remember how a couple of times we busted out different, different tools that we can use to, to really get, dig deep into what the Bible originally meant in, in its original language, right? One of those tools was called the interlinear. So we're going to check that out too. I'm going to do some screen sharing right now. And I'll go ahead and, uh, there's going to be a little, there's going to be all these pictures behind me. These are just examples of Moses being shown having horns, right? Why would they do that? <laughs> Typically the horns represent like devils or demons or something that's bad, right? But even the people that drew this, they revered Moses. They were Christians, um, or they would say that they're Christians or Jewish or, you know, Hebrew or whatever it may be. And they're not drawing horns on him in order to like make him look like a devil or something that's evil. Right. So let's check out where this actually comes from. I'm going to check out the actual verse. Thanks again, Anthony on TV. High five, high five to you. Uh, let me go ahead and move the alerts to just real quick. I'm going to put those alerts so that they're right behind my head. Pow. All right, cool. All right, sweet. Now let's go ahead and I'm going to share, I'm going to share this Bible verse with you and you can, you can open up your Bible too, if you'd like to and follow right along. 
All right, I'm going to have to scooch this one over a bit. I'm going to put that right behind me just for a bit. I don't know if it's going to cut off some of the pictures or images or whatever, right? All right. Well, actually, just for a minute, I'm going to take those down. <laughs> it's totally in the way. All right, just for just for a second here. So check this out. This comes from the uh, Donna. Wow, thank you so much, Donna. High five to Donna, too. This comes from, uh, there's different versions of the Bible, right? Of course, most people are familiar with like the King James version of the Bible, which is written in a sort of a, like a Shakespearean kind of a language. Then there's the new King James, which cleaned it up a bit. And then there's many, many other hundreds of different iterations and translations of the Bible itself. This is the only one I could find where it actually says that Moses grew horns or that he had horns on his face. It's called the Dewey Rames Bible. And if you look it up, the Dewey Rames Bible was written... Uh, it says down here, this was written in 1582, right over here. It's, see that right there, 1582? Originally published, I would say, in 1582. So it was written before that, right? So if we go to the verse in question, it's Exodus. Up here you see Exo, that's Exodus 34, 29. So chapter 34, verse 29. And right here, I'll just read it. It says, And when Moses came down from the Mount of Sinai, he held two tablets of the testimony, and he knew not that his face was horned from the conversation with the Lord. So this particular verse, this particular Bible, this particular translation of the original Hebrew, which I'm going to show you here in just a second, says that Moses had horns on his face from this encounter that he had with the Lord of the Hebrews up on Mount Sinai, right? Which is really interesting. So what does it normally say? Let's go ahead and check this out, right? If you Google it, let me go ahead and make this bigger. All right, if you Google it, Moses having horns, Bible verse, it says, it's clear then that at least some Jews believed that Moses had horns. But is that what Exodus 34, 29 originally meant? Or was this a later interpretation? It turns out to be a difficult question, and there are prominent scholars to be found on either side of this discussion. This is a huge debate amongst this particular community of um, of biblical scholars, you know, who really get into the exegesis of the Bible, uh, of the Old Testament, of the Torah, the Tanakh, the you know, um, the Old Testament stuff like that. So they have no idea. Now I'll show you where the debate lies. So in order to find that out, we need to go to the inner linear version of uh, of the Old Testament, which I'll bring up for you right here. Now, what I'm going to do real quick, since we're going to have this up here, is I'm going to scooch this one over so we can read that. And then I'm going to put my fun little pictures of Moses with horns right back up here, right behind me. <laughs> All right, cool. So there's you, there's you, there you can see it in the background, Moses with his horns, etc. right? There it is. Boom. Really interesting that they depict him like that. All right, cool. So I'm going to keep that up here and I'm going to return to the biblical verse. Now this is called the interlinear. Okay. So what this does is it gives you the, the exact uh, translation. It shows you the, the original Hebrew words or the modern Hebrew words, I should say, right? So it says up here, when he came down and it's written, it's really written uh, from right to left. So we'll read it from right to left. When he came down, I have to read it from left to right in the English, right? So this up here, this says, when he came down from the mountain, uh, and then it says that Moses not did know. So when he came down from the, mo from the mountain, Moses knew not that, and then this is the word in question. This is the word that the scholars have debated about and wondered about. This right here is the word koran. You could pronounce it in many different ways, including Quran, which is very interesting. Uh, it says that he did not know that shone. Now, they, they put the word shone right there, which means to radiate, to shine, that he had a shine on his face. And that's how most translations of the Bible actually write it out. He knew not that his face shined, uh, the skin of his face shined. Right. And then it goes on to say, uh, the skin of his face shined when he talked with him or with God. So when he was up on the mountain, he came down. The people were like, Oh my God. <laughs> like, wow. Oh my Moses. I don't know what they said, but, uh, the people were extremely surprised and caught off guard because Moses's appearance had drastically changed so much so that it caught the people off guard and they were all kind of shocked. Right. Which Moses was in a habit of doing that with people. So the question is, what does this word right here, cotton, this, uh, let's break this down real quick. All right. I want to show you these letters and what they mean. This is the modern Hebrew letter, uh, kof. 
Okay, so this is sort of our the equivalent to Q in the English uh, in the English alphabet or the English language. This one right here is resh, R E sh, resh, sort of a R E Y S H sound resh. And this last one right here is nun, which is in. Okay, now this is really interesting. This word, let's check it out. Let's go. Uh, let's go over to our handy dandy concordance, which which is another good tool that we can use to break things down. Uh, let's see. This is the this is the concordance that I like to use. This is called Strong's concordance. So I'm going to scooch this over just a bit so we can see it. So if you look up this word, as you can see, it's spelled different ways. Some people spell it karan, some kuran, some karan, some karen. Like the word karen, the name karen. This is where it comes from. So if your name is Karen, this is, we're talking about your name. Your name is in question today. What is the original meaning of your name, right? Now, check this out. At first, it says Karan, to send out rays, as in beams of light, as in rays of light. Isn't that something? Rays of light, beams of light, pillars of light, columns of light, as we talk about so so often here on my channel. Uh, and here you can see it. This is uh, Kof Resh Nun, right? And each each of these three letters or glyphs are actually ancient pictures. So in order to better understand the context of what the word originally meant, what we need to do is to figure out what these pictures are of, and then put those three pictures together in order to form a movie in our minds, which is how we originally came up with languages, right? These are these were all of the glyphs that we call our alphabets or our language letters come from. They all are pictures, right? They all have meaning to them. Now, it says here, Karan, and it says to send out rays, to send out rays. Interesting. All right, cool. And it also says it's a, a denominative verb from the word Karen. That's interesting. Let's click on that real quick just to see what that says. All right. So it says it's from the word Karen. Let's, what do you think Karen means? Karen means a horn. Oh, well, now, interesting, to send out a horn, to send out rays. Well, which one is it, right? This is talking about an actual horn, like an animal will grow out of its head, right? This is really interesting. It comes from Karen, or Karen, you could say, which means a horn. <clears throat> it, I mean, it means a horn in every sense of the word, basically, right? Tusks sometimes you see there, right? But it's a it's a bony protrusion from from the body, or typically from the head or the face, right? All right, so let's go back. Let's go back and check this out. Uh, now we looked it up, and uh, it says Karan to send out rays, and this is the word that was used. And it says Moses's face; he knew not that his face sent out rays, or the translation could be interpreted, he knew not that his face grew horns, right? So there's this is 50-50 on either side. People are totally not sure about it. Uh, however, all of the most of the Bible translations, they I could understand why they would not want to put that Moses grew horns. <laughs> like I totally get that. So I can understand why most of the translations don't have that particular side of the argument. You see what I mean? All right. Now, to send out rays, shone, as in to shine, as in to have a shine, as in to have the shining, right? As in the shining ones, beings of light, light beings, beings whose face or skin glowed or had a shine to it. This is super interesting. And it's related to various things that we've been talking about as far as the plasma apocalypse goes, Mount Maru, the Garden of Eden, uh, the Tree of Life, the Fountain of Youth, etc. All right, now let's check this out. Send out rays, that's what it means basically, right? Now it could be send out rays. It says down here to display, AKA to grow horns. So horns come out. It also says here to be fully developed. Now that's an interesting interpretation, right? Because I have a theory about uh, the ancient elven race or uh, the, the, the elven standard of beauty, right? Uh, the elves the, or the elven race or the El or those of the El, their offspring, also called the Elu, that, uh, that they lived for a very long time, as goes the stories, as goes the legends, right? They say that they were basically immortal in comparison to the human beings, right? That they lived for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So it is my theory, and it has been my theory for some time, that we were used to seeing, humanity was used to seeing uh, the younger 
of the elven race, the younger of the gods or the Elu or the El. And therefore, we would have that standard as our standard for beauty. Whatever the younger gods looked like, right, before they went through puberty, before they be started to grow hair all over the place and their noses became longer and bigger and their ears grew bigger and longer and they, you know, had you know, their, their gums receded and their teeth looked bigger and stuff. You know what I mean? So it's my theory that the L or the elven race, as they go past puberty or maybe even a second puberty, possibly more than that, right? Um, that they start looking more like werewolves than they do vampires or more like werewolves or more like dogmen or, uh, Bigfoot or monsters like that, big hairy humanoids, basically, right? With elongated features and stuff like that, witches and things like that. Um, they started to look more like that as they aged. That's, that's what happened to them when they started to get old and they weren't used to that. That only happened when they came down into this world and the pressure started to build and they started to age just like everything else in this world started to die and entropy was reintroduced into this world. Um, so that's that's one theory that I have about them, right? So that's interesting that it says to be fully developed, as in to be past the age of puberty, right? To be a grown adult elf or elven race or god or godlike being or mighty leader, just like Moses was a mighty leader. All right. Okay. So that's very interesting. Now, let's see here. We talked about the 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 particular Bible verse that does say that his face was horned. That's interesting that they did that. They put that translation in there. We talked about how there's a debate and a discussion on both sides, whether or not it meant that he came down from the mountain and he had these beams of light that were shining out of his face. And therefore, by extension, he just had a shine to him in general. Not that he had like columns like you might see in the pictures that I've put up, right? Or that he had horns at all. So this is very interesting. Let's check it out. We need to go further back than the modern Hebrew. So let's look up, uh, let's see, I just want to double check my work here. All right, so we looked up the interlinear translation. Uh, let's see, we, we looked up in the concordance what it means, which it means is to send out rays, right? To send out rays. Now think about this. If you're sending out rays, that doesn't mean that you have a glow. That means that you have rays of light that are separate from one another, that's really important, okay? Because that also means if it meant horn, it would just be one horn. If it means two, it means they must be separated, right? This is going to really tie into the ancient Phoenician when we look at it right now. All right, so if we look it up real quick in uh, Wiktionary, I like Wiktionary as a website to, to look up etymology of words. Um, that's one of, my, one of the websites that I like to use. So if we look it up in Hebrew and we look up the etymology right here, which means the origin of the word or the study of the origin of words, it says karn, which means horn. This is really interesting. This is now, if you have somebody who has a horn and it's a strong horn, you would call them the horned one or the one with the strong horn or strong horns, which would be karnos or karonos. Kronos, right? Now, Corona also, by extension, can also mean uh, a shiny, you know, halo of light or whatever, right? So these words are all really interesting how closely related they are. But it says here it can mean horn, antler, as in an animal, right? Or, it's, see, this is the first one. They put this one first, a horn, an actual physical horn that sticks out of a person's face. Second, Secondary is a ray or a beam of light. Also very interesting. So right now I'm speaking as if Moses was an actual physical human being. Okay. Or that, you know, that, that he was some type of humanoid person. Okay. I'm also keeping in mind in the back of my mind that it may be a cartoonification of natural phenomenon that happen where beams of light shoot up and out of our world. Okay. So keep that in mind too. All right. So it also can mean like a horn, a, a, a bugle in the, uh, in the old Hebrew world, they would have called that a shofar. So they took the horns of animals, they cut them off, you know, hollowed them out or whatever. And then they would use those as actual horns and they would, they would blow on those horns in order to alert people to different things that were happening. Right. So the shofars or the horns of animals. All right, I'm going to get rid of that one real quick. We're going to get rid of the Strong's Concordance. Uh, let's see, we're going to get rid of, I'm going to keep that one there and I'm going to get rid of that. 
Now, we'll get to that in a minute. That's really interesting. I would like to break down this word in its original meaning. And I don't have it pulled up. We'll get to real horns in just a second. All right, so we're going to go to kolf. Now, the letter karan, or the word karan, starts with the Phoenician letter kolf, which is what we're about to look up. It's Q, basically. Now, if we look it up, it looks just like this, okay? So, there's different interpretations. There's different, you know, uh, ways that this looks like. People will say that this means different things to them, different communities, you know, scholars and whatnot. And uh, basically, we're looking at the Phoenician, and also it's known as the Paleo-Hebrew. But this right here, this little glyph with a circle, with a line going all the way through it and sticking out. Now, sometimes it actually, let me see if I could find an older variant of it. The older variant was a circle. Let's see if we could find it. It was a circle that had a line horizontally all the way through it. Okay, let me see if I can find that one real quick. I should have, I, I thought I already had an example pulled up, but maybe not. Mm, see, this one right here kind of does. Um, as, as time went forward, all of these initial picture forms got shorter and shorter and shorter as people, you know, stopped carving them and stuff and they got tired of writing, you know, drawing entire pictures. They started doing things more quickly and more shorthand, right? Uh, let's see if we could find one that has the original form on it. Uh, I don't see one. So if you'd like to find it on your own, you're free to. Otherwise, I'm just going to show you what it did end up turning into over time. Yeah, I don't, I don't really see an original one up here yet. All right, cool. So just to save time, I'm going to go ahead and go just back up to the accepted... Phoenician slash Paleo-Hebrew form of the letter Q or Kolf, which is what Karan starts with. So the Ka sound was a guttural. Sometimes it turned into the like a G sound, like Ga, Ga, Ka, Ka, like all that back of the throat kind of a sound, like a cut sound, um, which is which is appropriate given what I believe that this actually symbolizes. Now, some people would say that this this is a glyph for the back of the head. Okay, now Resh, the, the letter R, which is the next letter that I'll show you, actually means head. It actually means like a, a picture of a human head. And by, and by extension, it means top or at the top of, like the head is at the top of the body, right? But this, this is the first letter in Karen, which was interpreted, the word that was interpreted to mean either horns coming out of Moses' head or beams of light emanating from, from Moses' face, right? So, we have to imagine this in order to figure out what the word originally meant. We have to, we have to refigure out, right? We have to put this back together. What this letter, what this picture was of. Now it's hard to tell what that picture might have been of, right? But if you look at the rest of the uh, Phoenician letters, right, you can you you get an idea of of what they were. Oftentimes, they were parts of the body that were, or you know, ideas that were very easy to understand. It, they were like emojis, basically. They were written in ways that children should be able to look at it and say, oh, I, I know what that means. You know what I mean? I, I understand what that symbol is trying to say, especially when you surround it with other symbols, right? To give it more context. So some people will say that this means um, the back of the head, right? So imagine like, like, the, like the circle is somebody's head and you're looking at like a ponytail that goes all the way down. Or this this sometimes is, is interpreted to mean like uh, the nape of the neck, right? Right at the back of the neck or the top of the spinal cord. Um, so so quite often this this in in the modern translations and guesses, okay, this it's accepted. One of the accepted translations of this glyph is the back of somebody's head, okay, which is really interesting. I like that, but I don't, I don't, I'm not really convinced by that one. Now, over here, you actually see that some people, another translation, some people have t interpreted this to mean the eye of a needle. Okay, I could see that, how there would be like a hole and then you would have to put a string up through the hole, I guess. You know what I mean? I, I could see how that could be interpreted as the eye of a needle. Still, I'm not super convinced and I'm not really seeing the eye of the needle in that particular one. Um, so I'll tell you, I'll tell you, let me, let me share with you my, my translation of what I believe the letter Kof originally meant. All right. So let me show you this. Now, this is where we get our letter Q, by the way. So if you just tilt this one, right, just tilt it a little bit. That's the letter Q. All right. So that's where that comes from. All right. Now, 
I want to share this interesting little piece, this little tidbit from this website that talks about the letter Kof. And I will highlight it right here. I don't know if I can make it bigger, so I'm just going to read it. But it's it's uh, talking about the Coptic uh, letters and stuff. So it says, in Coptic, which is a type of language, which is directly related to the word Kop, by the way, Coptic, Kop, okay, that's very, very much related. Uh, in Coptic, or, you know, it's very, it's related to like uh, Egyptian, basically. In Coptic, the Kappa, you see right there, Kappa? The Kappa has the num, uh, numeral or numerical value of 20. Uh, that is the one as a score. The back of the head, remember as we talked about how it might be the back of the head, the back of the head suffices to show the hinder part. But the hinder part signified is the kep or kept, the hinder thigh, the feminine kava. Now this word kava is related to kop, as we've talked about, kava. Now it says uh, kava and as kof modifies into ko, so the Egyptian kaf becomes ka, the hieroglyphic which is pictured right here. I don't know if you can see this very well. I'll show it to you in just a second. Let me read the rest of this. So it turns into the, uh, the, the Egyptian equivalent of kof, right, in some, according to this person at least, is this glyph right here, this picture, which is uh, ka, which is related to kava, the sign of the vagina or the female, you know, private parts or whatever, uh, and the womb where the babies are born or the babies grow, I should say. The ka, kat, kahat, or kapt, kapt, kept. I mean, there's different pronunciations of these words, right? And it says it probably follows that the Hebrew kof represents the hieroglyphic ka. Now, let me show you this uh, hieroglyph right here. Let's see if I can zoom into it. That's as, that's, as, that's as far as I can zoom right there. Okay, so you, can you see it right here? You can see how it's basically, there's a line and then there's a circle right there. Now, just like I talked about in the, in the older Phoenician, these letters, they kind of change direction over time, okay? And there's reasons for that, which I'll have to explain another time. But these these letters sort of started turning upside down over time, okay? all Many of our letters in the English alphabet, at the very least, are upside down, okay? Like the letter A, for example, uh, you can take like a, an upside, like a triangle, put, you know, this is basically a letter A, but if you turn it upside down, it is the head of an ox, with like the stems of the A being the horns that shoot out from the face of the ox, okay? So the letter A is an upside down ox head. Same thing happened with all these other letters, right? So, kof. Kof is, there's a direct relationship between kof and an Egyptian glyph that means, or that, that, that can be said kava or ka, which implies the female body part, right? Now, kava sounds a lot like cave, which is where I believe the word comes from, the cave, okay? A cave is an opening in the earth or the, in a mountain, right? And that original glyph that I showed you, which was uh, this one right here, right? Originally, it was a line and it had a, a little opening in it. So it's used to represent like an opening. Some people would say it meant like the sunrise or whatever. I'm not convinced by that just because you wouldn't show the bottom of the sun if you had a line for the sunrise. It would be a line that had a little bump at the top. That would be a sunrise, right? But if it goes all the way around, it's showing you a cave, right? It's showing you an opening or something that is split. So this is what I believe that the letter kof originally implied was split. So this glyph right here that starts with karan or koran or keren, which means horns or beams of light that shoot out, means split. It's the very first letter in uh, kof, in the actual, I mean, in, in Quran or in Quran or however you want to say it, right? Um, in the word that means horns, it means split. So that's the first picture in order to figure out what the word Quran means or Karen, if your name is Karen, it means split. Okay, so that's interesting. So let's take that one first. If this means split, let's just suppose, right, that this means split. The next one is resh. So karan is k, which is this one. R, which is the head glyph. So let me show you that real quick.
All right, so let's see. Let me show you a better one. This is more modern. This is what it sort of turned into over time. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna type in head because that's what it means. That way I can get the original picture. Resh, resh. Where is it? Resh, 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 resh. Boom, boom, boom. Maybe there's no Y. Let's take out the Y. There we go. All right. So let me make this smaller so I can go over it a bit quicker here all right so the letter r basically meant head and it's pronounced resh i don't know why i can't find a picture of a head like that's the oldest one is the picture form of an actual head basically right uh so instead of trying to find and search for a picture on the spot i'm just going to go to an article that would say it just so you can see that it's correct resh right here boom all right so check this out so if we go over here, it says Resh, boom, pictogram of a head. Okay, so it's right there. You could, you could do your own research. Um, I highly encourage you to do your own research. So the first letter in Karan, which meant either horns or beams of light, was something that I believe means split, right? Something that is a split. There is a divider. There is a separator, okay? Split. The next word, Resh, which means head. So split, head. Right. The last one was noon, which was the letter in. Now, if you look that up, I'll save you the time and stuff. I don't want to look them all up right now. But basically, noon is the letter in. And originally, it was like a squiggly line. Some people interpret that to mean a serpent or a snake. But I interpret that to mean plasma because it also meant it didn't really mean serpent or snake. It meant life. It meant the substance of life. So other people uh, interpret that as meaning like you know, um, semen and stuff like that that comes from the males or whatever. I can see how they would say that, but I would go even deeper and say that it means uh, electricity. <laughs> like, like it means plasma that, that, that moves about in waves, waveform like that. So we've got split head and light or plasma. Split head plasma. So if you go according to the ancient picture form translation, right, what it would mean is that there is something about the face or the head that is split and it has life, right? Or you could say growth, which would be secondary to life, okay? Growth is an implication from life. Everything that has life grows, right? But growth is what happens after the life. The life has to be there first in order for things to grow. So life was initial. So initially, if you translate it according to the ancient Phoenician, I lean towards personally, it means that Moses' face shined beams of actual light. Okay, that he had beams of light shining from his face. Somewhere on his face, was it his eyes that had beams? It doesn't say. It just says basically it implies somewhere on his head. Okay, that he had these beams, uh, split beams. That's how you know. It's not just a glow. It's not just an aura around his face in general, but there was these beams of light that came out of his face. Now, I've talked about, and I suppose many times, that those who have uh, an amplified soul, an amplified spirit or energy, right? Um, especially those who, are, who live closer to those places of power, or energetic amplification here on our world, on, a, on the terrestrial world, that your eyes may actually shine, that they may actually glow, just like Superman's eyes light up and light comes out. So if you're in the dark and you have eyes that shine, naturally you're going to see beams of light that come out of the face because light makes, you know, columns of light, pillars of light, beams of light that that shoot out and emanate from the hole or, or from the place of origin, right? It's not like it's a laser like Superman and you just burn stuff with it or whatever. I mean, it could be, but at the very least, if you have eyes that shine light and you you stand in a dark place, people would see actual pillars or, or beams or rays of light that are coming out of your eyes, right? Now, could it be that he was irradiated? That's another possibility, but it wouldn't just be, I wouldn't assume that it would just be his head, right? Like, oh, his head was irradiated, but for some, for some reason, his arms were not, his fingers were not, his hands were not, right? They draw this uh, beams of light coming out of his head. So maybe they misplaced it thinking that the translation was horns, right? That it grew up out of his head, that he grew horns or whatever, when in reality, it was 
light coming out of his eyes from an amplified spirit from his encounter with God up on Mount Sinai, which is Mount Maru, which is a plasma volcano, which is the source and the place, the seat of God's throne where the power comes up and the light comes up and it emerges from that place in our world. And those who are near to it uh, resonate with it automatically. It re we resonate with the powers that we're near to, right? So if Moses went close to an extremely powerful energetic source in our world, stands to reason that his spirit would have been amplified on the inside, the windows to the soul, right? Would have sh They would have seen his eyes shining out light or pillars or beams or karan, koran, uh, illumination, right? That his eyes would have actually glowed, basically. Which is really interesting, too, because there's a story in... Uh, what was it? The book of uh, the book of Enoch, the first book of Enoch, I believe. Uh, Enoch one talks about the birth of Noah, and Noah that his birth was described as his eyes shining. That he was born with eyes that shined just like the angels or the fallen ones or whatever you want to call them. They had shining eyes too, right? Because they came up there from an energized, electrified. Um, fractal verse out there in the heavens or Elysian field space, etc., which is really interesting. All right. Uh, so now that's, that's, that's if that's what's that's one interpretation, right? Another one is that the character of Moses is just a cartoonified version of like, you know, these anode and cathode mountains that shine and he goes up to Mount Maru and stuff like that. But let's suppose that Moses was a real person, right? Let's suppose that he's a phys it's, it's speaking about a physical humanoid, right? So the question is, could humans or humanoid right creatures, could they actually grow horns? Well, just like I talked about, right? The elven race is oftentimes drawn with horns. I'll, I'll just look it up on the fly right now, right? Uh, elves with horns. Watch. They're just random. I mean, it's going to be, you know, from people's imagination. Wait, what does that say? Hold on. I want to read that actually. It says wood elves are easily identifiable by their slightly pointy ears deer -like, and deer-like antlers. Okay, so these magical horns are okay. So elves are often depicted with horns. Let's just check out some pictures just so you can, I could just show you, you know, why do, why do people have this? Why would you even associate an elf with having horns, right? Because they're not always depicted like that. Well, this would be an elf who has started going through their first stage of puberty. This elf is not, is probably not, you know, way older than I am, way older than our oldest humans that live today. This elf is probably at least a hundred or 200 years old and they're starting to grow horns because that's a, that's a part of what our bodies do. Okay. Our, 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 our bones will continue to grow. And if they start to, to coalesce or they start to come together, they'll naturally just start growing out horns in different places. Right? So these would be older elves. Now you can see they're kind of younger looking. Let me see if there's a male one. I want to, I want to, I want to show you an example. So this guy, eh, I don't like the deer horns. I mean, that's, it's kind of cartoonified. Uh, let's see. So let's see if I can just get like a, a male elf. Here we go. Uh, that's kind of weird looking. Well, you get the idea, right? This dude, this is fine. So this guy right here, right? He's, they kind of show him with some horns here. Let me zoom in. So you can see he's like sort of clean shaven, got like that avatar Navi type of look to him, but his ears are starting to get long. That's because the ears are one of the parts of your body that do not stop growing. So if you live to be a thousand years old, imagine how long your ears would be. Imagine how pointy they would be, right? You'd be a Vulcan. Like you'd look like an elf basically. Um, so, but you can see he's all clean shaven. It doesn't look like he's really going through, you know, too much hair is starting to grow, which means that he's still a younger class of L or elf, right? But he's starting to grow those horns, which means he's starting to go through the puberty process, which usually would mean he would be promoted to get out of the eyes of the public humans because we associate that with evil you know, demons and devils and stuff having horns or whatever, right? Because we don't grow horns because we're young. Every single one of us, okay? We are, we normally, during the golden age, we would grow horns. We would have, we would grow tails, horns, all kinds of interesting things if we allowed our bodies to advance further, further along in our development, right? But right now we have like this sort of Benjamin Button disease where we, we're like children that grow old really quick, right? 
uh, which is why I often say that I feel like a, a kid still, you know, and I, I feel like I live in a world full of children and everybody's pretty childish. Well, if we are actually children in comparison to how long we used to live for, I'm not talking about a hundred years. There's a Bible verse. Let me, let's look this up. Um, there is a Bible verse that says that a child will be considered a child at a hundred years old. So Bible verse child at 100, we'll say, I'm just going to, I'm just going to see what it has here. Uh, let's see. Two, two, two. I'm going to look at, I'm actually going to pull up some articles. Isaiah 65, 20 American standard version says there shall be no more thence or from now on an infant of days, nor an old man that has not f- filled his days for the child shall die at a hundred years old, or you'll stop being a child at a hundred years old. And the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. So for me, this is saying basically that you're, you're considered a child until you're a hundred years old. All right. So those of us who make it past a hundred to be like 101, you barely have just officially stopped becoming a child. It's just that we have this, uh, puberty, it sets on earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier as the pressure in our world increases and increases. And therefore, and by extension, uh, the exponential entropy that's introduced into this world or sin or degradation or whatever you want to call it, the breakdown of our actual cells and cellular structure, uh, that, that gets older and older and older, quicker and quicker and younger and younger, right? So you're all children. That's the good news. You're just a child. Who was that? Hold on. Let me see who that was. I was, I was in the zone. Mary. Oh, Mary Cronin, 1111. Thanks, Mary Cronin. High five. Appreciate you. All right, cool. So Um, let me show you some examples. Okay. Can humans actually have horns? Yes. Here are just a few examples. It's a little, you know, you're not used to seeing humans with horns. I understand. Okay. But this happens, especially to those who, who start getting older. Look how old these people are going to be. I'm going to show you some of these people. Look at this woman right here. Uh, hold on. Let me take off the Moses picture real quick. Is that one? Yeah. All right, cool. So you can see this lady, she's pretty famous for having grown a horn and these people will try to cut them off and they will grow back (laughs) just like Hellboy. Okay. These horns will grow back. Why? Because they're part of your body that continues to grow. Okay. Your, your skull will get bigger and bigger. That's why, that's why older people tend to have like bigger heads or whatever. It's like, no matter how much plastic surgery and stuff they get, you can tell they're still older, right? Cause they have, their skulls are massive. They're getting big. They get big heads or whatever. Um, so that's what imagine if, if you lived right to not be a hundred or 80, which is hundreds ridiculous. Nobody lives to be a hundred these days, right? That you, that's, that's a hundred years ago. People used to live to be a hundred these days. People live to be like 65 or 70, maybe, right? I don't know what the official number is, but it matters not. All right. So this lady right here, she's totally has a horn growing out her head. She's got a little tiny one over here. This dude right here, also an older person. I don't know if you can see that. Boom. This dude right here, he's got a little horn that pops up out of the back of his head there. Um, We see stuff like this. Okay. Especially if they have tattoos and weird stuff like this is body modification. Okay. This, I mean, this, this has a truth to it. Okay. Even though that looks weird and demonic and scary and satanic or whatever, there's still truth to what people are doing to mutilate themselves because I feel they resonate with the time that was fantasy to us today, the time that we've forgotten about, which I call our ancient oblivion. Check this lady out over here on the right. Fapow, big old horn, like, like a goat horn, just straight out of the middle of her face. Okay. This happens way more often than you might think. These are, these are not just random instances, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people grow horns. Right. I mean, and, and, and the problem, see the reason these horns don't look beautiful or, you know, pretty like little pointy horns, like, you know, you might see people wearing at a Halloween costume party, all sexy horns or whatever is because we live during the time of uh, degradation. Okay. So anything that we have in this world, these are just, these are fake ones. I I, I can't stand the fake ones. Look at this dude's head, man. These are real. That's a real one. Okay. That's a real one. You could see he tried to chop it off up there, just like Hellboy. And you see all these people are older people for the most part, right? This lady's got a huge one right there. I'm going to go back up. Okay. I'm just going to leave it on up here. 
Because I don't, I don't know what kind of pictures they're going to show. I just, I approve of those ones so far. All right. You can do your own research and find hundreds and hundreds of examples of people that are born and not born with, uh, but they grow old. And as they start to grow old, it's like they go through another stage of puberty where they start to grow horns. Just like some of you older people out there will notice you're starting to grow hair in weird spots that you're not supposed to be growing hair. Well, imagine the elven race. Imagine the mighty leaders like Moses, was a mighty leader, right? Imagine you get close enough to an energetic source that it advances, right, your uh, process or, or whatever. I don't know. Um, or, or just imagine that you live for a very long time. Moses, let's say he got close to the fountain of youth. God himself, the Lord, would be considered the fountain of youth, right? Uh, the source of all energy or, what, or whatnot manifest in the burning bush on top of the mountain, the Mount of uh Sinai or whatever, right? So he's able to live for a very, very, very long time, just like uh, the you know the the patriarchs that came before Abraham and um, Adam and all these people that came before. Biblically speaking, just biblically, okay. These are just examples biblically. There's extra biblical. There's other religions and stuff that harken back to the time when people lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. But as we get closer to the apocalypse, lifespans shrink. People used to be born with tails, <laughs> like, right? Now, now there's many, I'm not going to pull it up because it'll show people's butts and stuff. And I don't want the, I don't want the video to get flagged, but you can also pull up just as many, if not more pictures of people who are born with tails or just ha still have tails, right? Oftentimes they cut them off when they're born. The doctors will freak out. They'll see something be like, Oh my God, it's abnormal or whatever. And they will snip that tail right off. Just like they snip off other body parts at birth and do other weird things to children who are born. Right. But these are natural occurrences. These are not evil or satanic or bad or anything. This is, this is just what the body does as it goes through its various processes right? All right, cool. So I think we've made the point on that. So Moses very well could have had physical, actual horns that grew out of his skull, that his skull, his bones of his face grew horns. Could be. Could also be that beams of light emanated columns of light that his face irradiated and uh, his soul irradiated and therefore pillars of light, beams of light, right? Or split beams or of, of life or plasma came out of his face, it could be both. So instead of these people arguing back and forth, no way he had horns, blah, 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 blah. No, he had, it had light. No, he did have horns. It's totally possible. You know what I mean? Like instead of that, let's think about both sides of that equation. It could have been both. So this is really interesting. All right. What I'd like to do is I'm going to shut down. We, we went over the, the, the word. So just to, just to recap. Okay. Real quick. This is the word in question. Um, kof, resh, Noon or QRN, if you want to look it up and type it into the keyboard, QRN. Sometimes you could type in KRN, all right? So those, some of our modern uh, letters are interchangeable. So, but if you look up and you type in QRN, that's also the Quran, by the way. So let's, let's actually, just out of curiosity, let's ask Google, what does Quran mean? Boom. What does Quran mean? Now they, they spell it K-O-R-N sometimes, uh, or Q, same, it's the same word. But what does, it, what does it mean? Literally, what does it mean? Uh, let's see. To read, to recite. Okay, interesting. Uh, etymology? To read or to recite. Okay, well, that's interesting. I don't know. I'm going to have to get into that 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 another time i was just curious all right so uh i'm going to leave this one up just in case people want to see it again i'm going to open up the chat to this was interesting check out this hieroglyphic uh symbol right here too and the connection to cave kava split and opening something that splits and and therefore opens things up you know what i mean like a cave and stuff like that right now remember these words they 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 change over time. There's, there's implications and there's implications of those implications, which, which are how our languages grow, which is the whole story of the Tower of Babel, which you should tune in another time. Um, oh, Kof. I actually wanted to break down Kof itself. So that letter Q, right, starts with Kof as it should, which means split, right? And then it's, uh, it's the Vav, which, which is a hook, which means attached to or of, right? So, a split of, and then the f is this, pay, and it means mouth. A split 
of the mouth or a split mouth by extension means to project or to speak or to come out of the face. Okay. So it's a split that comes out of the face, which is really interesting. That's the actual, um, if you break down the word kof itself, Max Collins donated $10 in the super chat. Thank you, Max. Let me see what you said. All right. I'm going to open up for questions, uh, and comments in the chat. If you'd like to, I'm going to go ahead and get the chat pulled up here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just get rid of this real quick. Boom. There we go. I'll go ahead and put these pictures up. These are fun to look at. And if you have a question or a comment, please type in at jdreamers. Uh, spell it all the way fully correct. And I'll go ahead and get your questions and your comments put up. We'll do this for about five or ten minutes. Boom. I'll just leave that right there. And let me get... Let's see, where's the chat? I'm going to get the chat pulled up here. Max Collins. Oh, he put a little super pair in the chat. Thank you. That's cool. I like that. Man, thank you all for your support. All right, we got pop out the chat. I'm going to pop that, pop out that chat. Boom. And I'm going to actually make it a little smaller so I can see more. All right, just give me about 20 seconds here and I'll get the chat going. And we'll put that chat right up on the screen. If I can find it, where did I put the chat? There it is, papal. All right, cool. So uh, type in at jdreamers and I'll go ahead and get to as many as I can here in the next five or 10 minutes. We'll, we'll see how it goes. All right, let me test this out, see if it works. Let's start with uh, Max's. Oh, sweet, it does work. All right, cool. Whoa, all right, hold on. Now, what I gotta do real quick is I gotta move the chat. There it is. No, one moment, one moment. Thank you so much, everybody. All right, cool. Is that it? Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay, sweet. All right, so I'm gonna put all of your stuff up here. I may big it, make it a little bit bigger there. So that's Max Collins, boom. And then also Max Collins had a little super chat sticker. These are what the super chat stickers look like. So you can put those up there and they, you know, sometimes they have words and stuff, which is really cool. Thank you so much, Max. I appreciate you. All right. Now I'm in the chat. I got it all pulled up. Joe Cool is putting the instructions too. If you'd like, if you have a comment about today's presentation, okay, try it. Let's try to keep it on topic. I appreciate it. Um, uh, go ahead and type in the full name at symbol and then G dreamers to get my attention. As I like the little Orco. You guys like those those new emojis I put in there? All right, sweet. Uh, so Nagagato is the first one that I see. Uh, let me make that a tad bit bigger. All right, so Nagagato is in the chat and says, Jay, uh, where did Moses learn from? So good question. So originally, uh, many of the stories indicate that Moses... Um, when he was a baby, he didn't really probably learn a whole lot. I'm assuming, I don't know. Um, but he was found on the, on the river in Egypt and he was found by royalty in Egypt. And, and so when he grew up as a young lad, you know, probably up until maybe his twenties or something, um, he, he was, uh, treated like a prince. So this is where the whole movie, the Prince of Egypt comes from. So he was learned and well-learned and well-versed according to the legends and according to the stories and the myths by the highest of the high within ancient Egyptian uh, civilization. So he would have grown up learning all of the mysteries of ancient Egypt that were, that the nobles were privy to. But after that, he was kicked out because he grew a conscience. Basically <laughs> he's kicked out of Egypt. They say, get out of here. So he, the, the, some other legends talk about how he went down into Ethiopia. And when he went down into Ethiopia, he had many different battles against wizards and other stuff like that. Walking wind woman just became a member of the good vibe tribe. Welcome walking wind woman. Um, I'm gonna put you up there real quick. Um, so just to finish up that question, like where did he learn from? He he's continuously learned throughout his life, but in his, in his younger days, okay. Which are not really talked about a lot. Um, you know, in, in many books and stuff, um, he grew up under Egyptian tutelage, but after that he, he took what he had learned and he went down into Ethiopia and he actually became a warrior down in Ethiopia and he helped to redeem the Ethiopians who were under attack by an evil wizard, basically. Uh, this is a whole different story. Okay. <laughs> like it's not in the Bible. Um, and he redeemed them and he helped them to get their, their city back and they made him king. And they actually gave him the, uh, the king, the real king was dead. He died in, in battle. So they made Moses the king and they gave him the old king's wife and stuff like that. And Moses wouldn't touch her, which helps to explain, you know, like, um, 
some really in, enigmatic verses in the Bible, in the actual Old Testament, where Aaron um, and Miriam, his his biological brother, brother and sister, they were kind of shaming him because he had uh, he had an Ethiopian wife, which was against the rules of the ancient Hebrews, right? But Moses was like, well, I didn't touch her. Like the rule is you're not supposed to have relations with them. Right, it doesn't say you can't have a an, an official Ethiopian wife. Anyways, he was given this wife. There's a whole story around it. Um, eventually, the people demanded that Moses be released and that they blessed him with all kinds of uh, treasures and stuff. And they asked him politely, you know, hey, please, would you would you allow our own people to rule because his wife was pregnant with the actual, you know. The, Ethiopian child or whatever. So when that child came of age, they blessed Moses, gave him a whole bunch of treasures and stuff and sent him out on his way. And that's whenever he starts wandering about and goes up into Midian and stuff. And when he finds his staff of God and other things like that. Anyways. All right. Hey, welcome to Walking Wind Woman. Good to see you. Thanks for joining the Good Vibe Tribe. I'm jumping back into the chat. Type in at JDreamers if you'd like to get my attention. If you have a question or anything, Rage Against the Machine says, Cacti, time to wake up. I Good jam, right? Good jam. Uh, Unlearned System says, have you heard uh, Moses being about nine meters tall? I have, and I would say it's probably closer to 15, right? They, they said that he was um, he was uh, like 10 L's tall or something like that, which would equate to a, today's uh, length or standard would be about 15 feet. So that that measurement was taken from the tip of your of your middle finger all the way to your elbow, which today is on average about 18 inches or so. But if you consider that back then, right, the length from the tip of somebody's finger to their elbow, if if we actually grew bigger and we were more gigantic back then, that means that Moses had the potential to be much taller than anywhere between 9 and 15 feet. He would have been closer to probably between 20 to 25 or maybe even 30 feet. It just, it just depends on how long that standard of measurement was from uh, the tip of the finger all the way to the elbow, right? So yes, I have heard that. It also says that that's how long that his staff was, the staff of God that he had, you know, plucked out of the ground or whatever. It's, that story is not in the Bible either, okay? Uh, read the book of Joshua if you want a lot more details on uh, Moses' backstory. It's a really cool backstory. Martyr R, or Marty R, says, uh, Jay Dreamers, was he a general in the Egyptian army? I don't know if he was a general. I don't know. I can't remember what rank Moses was. I know he was a prince. You know what I mean? Um, and I know that he was entrusted with a lot of, uh, you know, he had a lot of respect and stuff. And he was he was allowed to tell people what to do, just like any noble would be able to. All right. Uh, let's see. Jumping back in the chat. And we got, uh, let's see. Next up. It's B. What's up? It's B. Uh, I feel like you changed your name. Didn't you used to have a different name? I don't know. Anyways, J Dreamers, uh, do you think Moses knew hydrokinesis? He was a waterbender. Ooh, that's kind of cool. Why is that in front of my face? Hold on, let me move this chat highlight. I like it to be behind me. Boom. No? Did that not work? Did that work? Pow. There we go. All right, it's B says, uh, do you think Moses knew hydrokinesis considering that he parted the Red Sea? This is a serious question and not a joke. Hey, that's, this is the place for that, Okay. You can ask strange questions as long as you're not trolling or being weird or whatever, right? Um, and I, I, I totally know that you're not joking. So Moses parted the Red Sea. However, it was really not Moses, okay? It was God. The power of God is what parted the Red Sea. Now, I'll tell you my interpretation. There's various interpretations and theories and stories about how the Red Sea was parted. Was it called the Red Sea? Was it the Sea of Reeds? Was it an actual red water, etc.? right? Which I think it may have been. <clears throat> um, on my Plasma Ap Apocalypse playlist, right? There's many different videos that talk about how I believe, and I have a theory that, that puts forth the idea that our atmosphere depressurizes from time to time. When our atmosphere depressurizes, it increases buoyancy in the atmosphere to such a degree that things just float up into the sky. So, if this happened when the Hebrews were at the water's edge or even in the water, knee deep or whatever, they technically would have been able to stick their feet down into the sludge of the ocean. Many of you who've been out into the, the shallow parts of the ocean know what I'm talking about, very sludgy and muddy or whatever. 
but the water would have lifted up. But because they stuck their feet down in there, they didn't get sucked up or whatever. This is just a theory that I have, just so you know. Okay, this is my little theory, my perspective, that they this is why they were able to cross, slamming their feet down into the mud and keeping themselves stuck to the earth while the waters above were floating up into the sky and parted for them or whatever. As well, many other things probably would have floated up into the sky as well. Um, there's also, you know, some other theories out there, a more popular one. Who was that? Um, uh, there's, man, I can't remember the dude's name right now, but there's a guy that wrote a book, you know, almost 100 years ago. Um, and he has a, oh, Velikovsky, that's who it was. So Velikovsky, Emmanuel Velikovsky, he wrote this book called Worlds in Collision. And he put forth this theory that at the exact same time that this Red Sea was parting and lifting up into the sky, that the people reported, okay, that I'm just summarizing this and paraphrasing it in my own language, that uh, there were reports that the planet Venus, this big red ball with a comet's tail, was seen up in the sky, okay? And, uh, his theory is that the gravitational pull from Venus, you know, it got so close that like it sort of made things way less down here on Earth. Okay. I believe that what he's referring to as Venus was actually just the depressurization point in our sky that shows us the ionized hydrogen on the other side of our sky or the dome. Um, and then obviously the plasma would pour out looking like a comet's tail or a tongue of the gods or a horn, you know, is, is, it was interpreted in different ways. Uh, so hopefully that helps to answer that question for you. All right, jumping back into the chat, we've got... Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's really super kind. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's see, what else we got here? We got uh, Robbie Burns. Robbie Burns says, let's see, wouldn't it make sense that his interaction with a pure plasma filament on the burning cactus in the desert was what caused him to grow taller and grow horns. Possibly. That's possible. That's possible. I have different theories about, you know, whenever Moses had struck the, uh, the rock and the water poured out and stuff like that. So I've, I've got different ideas and I, I kind of personally believe that these stories are often cartoonified <laughs> events of natural things that actually happen in our world during these, um, during these apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic events. All right, sweet. Uh, you're super welcome. It's B. We got Joe Cool who says professional business emails. Oh yeah, so that's my email address. If you have a professional request or you know, you want me to be a guest somewhere, you want me to be a professional speaker somewhere, stuff like that, um, you can write out and reach out to me. It's uh, it's you know, unfortunately, it's not for personal messages. You know, I'm, I'm not really gonna read like really long letters or anything like that. But I also have I have this for professional invitations basically, and. Um, also, I have a P.O. box. So if you would like to like write me a personal letter, like fan mail and stuff like that, you can totally write to my P.O. box. Uh, or if you want to send things, a uh, huge shout out, by the way, where's Sage? Is Sage in the chat? Is Sage here? Hold on. I'm, I'm looking for Sage. Where is Sage? I actually texted Sage earlier and she hasn't texted me back. Sage sent some stuff to my personal email. I mean, to my P.O. box. Okay. Which, uh, by the way, is in my community tab. She sent me uh, this huge gift package for stuff, little trinkets for my son. I got a plasma ball. I don't know if she wants me to tell anybody this, but I'm, I just want to brag. I'm, I, you know, for her, I want to. I want to say thank you to Sage publicly. Um, so yeah, that was really cool. She sent some really cool gifts my way, a little letter and stuff. And, you know, that was really awesome. So big shout out to Sage. Um, you know, one of the best moderators I've ever had in my chat. Uh, Joe Cool, shout out to you too. Thank you so much. And uh, a huge shout out to Michael too. One of my subscribers named Michael. Um, that's all I'm going to say is Michael is out there. And he went and bought me and my son a two-night stay at an awesome, really ritzy, elegant resort way out in steamboat springs in colorado we just got back today that's why today's live stream stream was late because we just unpacked everything we had a blast i took a million pictures i didn't think about any kind of work or stuff or anything uh man we went into these hot springs i took the gondolas up the mountain uh we did all kinds of awesome stuff man we just lived it up for two days pretending to be super rich and it was great. So huge thank you to Michael and your family. Big shout out to you and your kids and your wife and everybody. You guys are all extremely kind, amazing people. And I consider, consider you to be my friends. So thank you very much. All right, so jumping back into the chat. We've got, let's see, we got Nagagato says, Jay, did Moses use the the ermine and the, and the thuum? That sounds like Uma Thurman, kind of the way that you said that. And the philosopher's stone. Uh, Moses... 
I believe he probably would have had access to that. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember if he had that, but it was for the high priest. I don't believe he was the high priest, so it was probably his brother. I mean, being that, you know, he knows his brother, Aaron. Aaron was the high priest. So I'm pretty sure he he could have borrowed it, maybe if he wanted to. He's talking about the the uh, the umim and the thumim, which is, I think what they're called. Little stones of light, light stones, which is really interesting. Could have a correlation uh, if the archivist, if you're watching the, the umum and the thumum could have a correlation to, uh, radium possibly like the element radium glowing and stuff too. So that's really interesting too. Uh, the philosopher's stone, I, I personally believe that that might be a type of philosopher's stone. If you want an actual physical, small example of that, but the philosopher's stone of the world to me is Mount Maru. All right. Martin Bryce says, uh, what's up happening? Jay dreamers. God bless. Thank you very much. Bless you too. Uh, let's see. We got Kimberly F says, howdy, Jay and mods. I can't participate. Okay. No worries. No worries. All right. I think we're about ready to wrap things up. Oh, Joe cool says, was, was it the plasma that changed Moses's face at the top of the mountain? Okay. Good question. So I believe that yes, it's short answer is yes, that he went to Mount Maru or Mount Sinai, Mount Olympus, etc. Right. And that he spoke with God or that he came so near to that energy or even went inside of the cave of saviors, right? Inside of that mountain, inside of Sinai, that he was inundated and charged and regenerated with energy so much that it amplified his spirit and that his eyes beamed out light so that whenever he came off that mountain, right? At nighttime and he's showing people the 10 commandments and stuff, they're... They're tripping, right? They're like, oh my God, what's Moses seriously saw God? You know what I mean? Like his eyes were shining. I I think that's what I like to think. All right. We got Flat Earth Zoomer in the chat says, good vibes. Glad you had fun. Thank you. We got Gaia who says, uh, glad you had a lovely break, Jay. Well deserved. Thank you. Cat Van Du, right on, right on. All right, cool. Uh, this is the this is the PO box. It's right up there. Joe Cool just posted that. You can also go just go go to the community section, check it out because I'm going to take this down and we're going to wrap things up for today. So I want to thank everyone for joining me for this special presentation of uh, did Moses did Moses have horns? Right. Um, I hope I'd like to see in the comments section which part of the presentation helped you the most or which part you found the, to be the most valuable or which part you found to be the most interesting. Those are the types of things I really like to see. I also am interested in hearing other people's input, stuff that you have found, right? Because I'm not the only one that researches. <laughs> like, let's, uh, let's put our heads together. All right. So until next time, I'm Jay Dreamer saying good vibes and goodbye.